Thank you very much for the invitation. Wonderful to be here with all of you today at this workshop. Today my talk is about how libraries can contribute to social science and data science research, and in particular in the area of understanding human values and AI. Before I get into some of the substantive talks, which are uh, a substantive part of the talks, which are summarized by those three images, and you'll, you'll see what they mean uh, shortly, I wanted to start with a brief history of the ingredients of AI, and this historical notion, I think, fits with what, how I'm going to be using uh, data from archives, and what I think is one of the key uh, advantages or um, points of usefulness for, for museums and libraries is doing historical analysis. So how did we get here with AI the last couple of years? Very exciting time. This conference is about machine learning, applied machine learning, but I'm going to try to convince you now that machine learning is just one ingredient of what has brought us AI, the first one being data, storage and bandwidth. So some key data technologies that are you know, older than AI, much older than AI, but still relatively recent in the scheme of things, of hard disks for efficient storage, relational database systems, the internet, which I think is an underestimated <coughs> uh, important feature of AI. You need to actually have common crawl uh, for, or Wikipedia for AI to work. And also digitization of analog data, especially optical character recognition. That's an, another underappreciated ingredient in AI is that you need long books. You can't just use New York Times. You won't get GPT-4 with the New York Times articles. You need books. And this really incredible corpus that we've put together collectively is available because of these technological breakthroughs of, of increasingly cheap uh, disk space and memory. Uh, it used to be, I think it says here, uh, $100 trillion to save one terabyte <laughs> back in the, uh, the 1950s. And now it's, you know, uh, $100, or it's less than $100 for, for, for hard disk space. At the same time, internet connectivity and bandwidth has gone up a lot. And that allows us to share that information. The second ingredient is compute. And, and this is you know, kind of both on the processing side of, of uh, you know, transistors-based microprocessors, multi-core CPUs and GPUs, uh, which um, this is like you know, a very well-known figure of Moore's Law, which is, I mean, it's pretty amazing this is still going. And I guess with quantum computing, it's going to go off the chart. Uh, but for now, we're, we're uh, doubling processor power every uh, uh, six months, or every, or every, it was six months, and it's every, every two years. And then in addition to developments in processing, we also have developments in modeling. And so that's the focus of this uh, conference of Applied Machine Learning Days. Um, uh, you, you still see many classical machine learning models like regression, decision trees, SVMs, random forest, gradient boosting. Uh, those gave rise starting in the late 1900s to uh, the emergence of C what I would call CPU-based deep learning, including convolutional neural nets that really got amazing uh, results on image analysis. Also, in, in my area of research in natural language processing, word embeddings were kind of the CPU-based uh, deep learning technology that really uh, opened up a lot of very interesting new questions in social science. And then most recently, I would call this the GPU-based deep learning era, and in particular, the emergence of transformers, which have really uh, you know, transformed uh, natural language processing, but also uh, all, all, all kinds of, all areas of, of artificial intelligence research and practice and implementation. I just want to point out in the slide that you know, those models develop because of technology, because of the compute coming in. And I think that is an interesting point to think about what comes next. One thing that we can already make a combination about, these two ingredients coming together, is data and machine learning also improves, already improves the data. So you get better digitization. Uh, you know, uh, previously, somebody had to look at those books and type it in. 
right? Before you had, can you imagine that? Like when like the first data they were making, you actually had to read the books and type it in order to get it into the computer. Uh, and it's only actually quite recently that OCR quality is very good. Um, the, 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 the digitization team at ETH Library can tell you about that. Um, and the, um, the data that I'm going to use in my, um, in my substantive part of my talk in a minute is based on uh, OCR text. And some early solution was, you know, like, uh, you know, distinguishing a B from an 8 uh, was very hard for a long time. They solved that, I guess, in, like, in the 90s. Um, and, but but uh, to get good, decent data, you had to have very good scans. And so that was like kind of an, what I would call like kind of an early solution to better digitization was just to give, have better cameras and scanners. And more recently, and I think we're actually still seeing this, uh, this, this process is like, I think we're at the beginning of this process rather than the end. But AI-based digitization with pre-trained lang vision language and, and, and audio models, um, I think is really exciting. Where we can, we, we can get high quality OCR with handwriting now. Uh, that I think is an amazing uh, technological development. Or if you have damaged historical documents, like they're all like, you know, worn out, you can kind of infer, you can fill in gaps. That's amazing. Uh, and also, uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a active research engineering area of extracting information from, from like tables and charts. Um, and so all of these technologies are, are data and machine learning come together to make better data. Uh, I think it's, you can also think about these developments in uh, multilingual uh, AI delivering machine translation. That is opening up a whole other data, a universe of data sets. Also AI-based audio transcription, like the OpenAI Whisper model, for example, is really uh, making the transcriptions that you get from that are so much better than they were just a few years ago. And that, these are really important uh, technological developments that will produce better data for the next generation of AIs. And so this slide kind of poses this question, data plus compute plus machine learning, does that equal AI? The whole internet, millions of digitized books, billions of parameters in the neural nets, the transformer models, and then the transformer architecture, these kind of software developments, what do we get from that? We get AI systems that are getting close uh, to human level intelligence, I would say. GPT-3, the kind of 2020 uh, era of AI. It hadn't really reached the mainstream, even though it was already pretty amazing if you were using it. It's like so much better than what was available before, but it hadn't captured the imagination because it wasn't anything like the next step, which had a final ingredient human values. We took GPT-3, data, machine learning, uh, and compute, added instruction fine-tuning and learning from feedback, humanizing this system, and that gives us ChatGPT, an AI system that I think is, I mean, I hope it's fair to say that often surpasses human level intelligence. Not always, often, often not. Maybe most of the time not, but often yes. And that's incredible. So injecting human values gave us AI. What are the implications for social science? And so that's the uh, next few minutes of my talk is about. And my title of this talk, AI and Human Values, AI is going to give us a new and deeper understanding of human values. And more specifically, to the thematic focus of this workshop, a historical view of those values. And I'm going to show you that in three ways. First, gender attitudes in the judiciary, evidence from US circuit courts. This is joint work with my colleagues Daniel Chin and Ariana Ornaghi. It came out uh, last year in the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics. We use a technology uh, kind of a, I, you, you call this kind of like a pre-GPT. This is like the CPU, uh, uh, CPU-based deep learning technology, uh, which has some limitations, but we can still learn a lot from it. But this feature of word embeddings that we get from, uh, we're, we're using uh, a word to vec or glove, global vectors, is language having a geometric, like spatial or vector representation, where for example, 
uh, man to woman and king to queen, a machine learning model, this, this word embedding model, can learn that ana analogy, can learn that concept from seeing, uh, seeing words together, from the co-occurrence statistics between words. And by looking at uh, comparing these pairs of words, like man and woman, uh, boy, girl, king, queen, you can extract a, a linear dimension in a, in, a, in a vector space corresponding to gender as a, as, a, um, uh, as a concept. And you get other things like verb tense and country and capital. Word embeddings really captured the imagination back in like early 2010s because they could solve analogies. A computer could solve an analogy. In this uh, paper on gender attitudes, we're focusing on uh, this gender dimension that I mentioned, which is uh, just extracting these pairs of terms and, uh, and uh, getting the direction that goes in that direct in that uh, in in in, in, the, in the space. And we also have a work to family dimension defined by a set of work kind of work and office terms and like family and home terms. And that's a classic uh, kind of stereotype that like in the um, implicit association test from psychology, they will ask people. You know, are you more comfortable putting together like a female words and home words or male words and office words? And people tend to have those kind of implicit uh, associations. And with word embeddings, we can construct vectors like this and look for those implicit associations in text. And so we're going to do that in the, in the case of judicial opinions on US circuit courts. So this is where the library aspect comes in. We have this really incredible corpus of uh, 300,000 uh, circuit court opinions from a law library, and uh, that those they're all like 50, they're like you know 20, 30, 40, 50 pages, and so it would be impossible to read those and say, oh, this judge is kind of old-fashioned about gender. This judge is not. This judge is progressive. Instead, we have to have computers construct vectors, sets of vectors for every judge and produce a gender stereotypes measure of the judges from these angles, the cosine of the angles. Where um, this one on the left, that means that the gender dimension is correlated with the career family dimension. That's gender stereotypes, typical language. Sometimes uh, judges don't have any stereotype. And there's actually a, a handful of, kind of, it's kind of rare, but a handful of judges that go against stereotype in their, in their writings. And this, I think, is already, you know, maybe it's like uh, uh, interesting descriptively. We can say, oh, here's, you know, there's gender stereotype language in the judicial, judiciary. But we wanted to know, could we use this as a measure of their attitudes in a social science framework? Does it influence their decisions? And to do that, we wanted to make sure we were capturing something meaningful about their attitudes. And so we validated it in a number of ways. First. Uh, this is a nice feature of the setting, is that there's random assignment of cases to judges. So it's not driven by, you know, the more sort of like feminist judges wanting to get into like, you know, women's rights cases. It's not, it can't be driven by that. We find this is almost like a, you know, kind of a, like a sniff test that female judges use fewer gender stereotypes than male judges on the same court at the same time. Younger judges, that is those from later cohorts, so those towards like, you know, the year 2000 versus the year you know, 1890, uh, they use fewer gender stereotypes. That makes sense. Judges with more daughters relative to sons use fewer gender stereotypes. And that's random, right? That's kind of a natural experiment. You can condition on two judges. One has a boy and a girl, and one has two girls. And the only two girls uses fewer gender stereotypes. And that's, you know, uh, most of the time, random. Like, that's like a, that's a, that's a coin flip. We find that less gender stereotypes is associated with more uh, gender neutral pronouns. So that's kind of like a one specific example of how this happens, where they say he, she, for example, rather than just he. Less gender stereotypes are associated with more empathic discussion of women's rights. And that's a, a kind of a small scale human evaluation. As I said, you, we can't read 200,000, 300,000 opinions, but we can read like 50 of them and compare judges based on that, and you see more empathic discussion of women's rights. That's the validation. Does judge gender stereotyping matter? We find that it matters for rulings. So the more stereotype judges tend to vote against expanding women's rights, 
and it matters for the treatment of colleagues. So the more stereotyped judges are more likely to reverse or reject the rulings of female judges. And this is conditioning on many, many features that we can control for, and this is a really rich data set. And so this is some of the best evidence we have so far that gender attitudes measured in language, in text, can influence high stakes decisions like those taken by US circuit judges. The second project I'm gonna tell you about is on emotion and reason in political language that is written with Gloria Gennaro. We are interested in emotional appeals in, in uh, politics, which we can all think of many of these, or like deliberation in, in uh, in Congress and politics where they say, okay, well, you know, let's, let's try to find this, the right answer with logic. We, again, thanks to the Library of Congress, <laughs> we have this incredible corpus of six million speeches going back to 1858 up until 2014. And of course, you can get the more recent years if you want. We, can, we use a similar technology to what I just told you about with the gender attitudes to construct a document vector for every speech and then we, kind of like what we did in the previous project where we, we looked at like a, a, a male to female dimension or a work to family dimension, in this project we construct an emotion to reason dimension or a cognitive to affective dimension. And we can do this with a set of, of, uh, of lexicons, a set of dictionaries built by linguistic psychologists. And for, given this dimension that we construct, from emotion to reason, we can take any speech and put it on that spectrum. And this is what it looks like. So on the left here, these are representative terms for the cognitive part, or the kind of the, the reason or rationality dimension. So you can see like uh, positive ones, kind of positive themed words and negative themed words. Uh, kind of, you know, you can see, this, is, this kind of makes sense. And then here's a couple of examples. Like, in my judgment, neither is true in the case of this amendment. It's very kind of deliberative, like cognitive, you know, neutral language. On the other side, we have emotion language, which looks very different. So serene and warm, cringe, stupid, disgust, frightened. And then with joy in his heart and a smile on his face, he graced practically every social occasion with a song. <laughs> or we Democrats may disagree, but we love our fellow men and we never hate them. So this is you know, kind of emotional appeals and political language. Uh, we also did human validation in this uh, project as well. We, we checked that the ranking of sentences as emotion or not that the, that the machine learning algorithm gives us is the same. Uh, humans agree with it about 90% of the time. Uh, so we're, we're, we're confident to use this in social science analysis. And this is just the time series of emotional language in Congress uh, going back, uh, let's, let's just say 1858 rather than 1958 at the top. Although we, we can kind of see there's these jumps during war, that makes sense. And there's this really interesting kind of trend break here, um, starting in the very late 1970s. And uh, we have a whole separate paper exploring this, uh, but uh, we can show that this is driven by the introduction of television cameras in Congress. So as soon as they introduced TV cameras and they started broadcasting it on this cable network called C-SPAN, they started using emotional appeals much more. That makes sense, I think, in, in retrospect. And actually, that's what they were worried about at the time. You look at the archives of like they're discussing C-SPAN, and they were worried about that, and they were right. So when are emotional appeals used in Congress? Um, we find that uh, Democrats get emotional about social issues, but Republicans get emotional about taxes. So it's like, you better not raise my taxes. <laughs> uh, which Congress members are most emotional in their language? We find that uh, the minority party, so those who are out of power, tend to use more emotion. Women in ethnic minority group, congressmen tend to use more emotions. And the more ideologically extreme parts of the, of the uh, political parties use more emotions. And you know, I think you can learn a lot from this. This is, it's, this is descriptive, uh, but you can kind of start seeing like, you know, emotions are used to appeal to voters, like, they, with, like on TV. And they also seem to be used to influence policy when formal power is lacking. The third project that I wanted to tell you guys about is on cultural change in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we don't even have a paper on this yet, it's just this slide deck, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I'd also be happy to get your feedback about it in the Q&A. 
Proverbs encode folk wisdom. So here are two proverbs that are from um, uh, 1600s England with an associated explanation. So uh, hold on, wait for the grasshoppers. It's about patience and careful planning are important virtues. One should not be impulsive and should consider all the factors before making a decision. The second one says, many get into a dispute well that cannot get out well. And this, set, this implies that people should be careful before engaging in a dispute and consider the potential consequences. The proverb also suggests that it is better to avoid conflicts. So I think, you know, me coming as a social scientist, like behavioral economist, I'm very interested in these because uh, I think that they help people kind of follow, uh, like, you know, good, uh, good rules for, for, for life. Um, and so if, if I'm worried about, like, uh, I'm getting impatient, I can just tell myself, hold on, wait for the grasshoppers, and it will help me be more patient. Proverbs are a very interesting cultural artifact, I, would, I, I believe. And they tend to be metaphorical and cryptic, and they have this unusual syntactic structure. These two are good examples of that. It makes them easier to memorize. So this is what, this is what anthropologists think about <laughs> proverbs. And they're easier to transmit across generations. So they're, they're kind, of like, kind of like part of a cultural DNA. Uh, proverbs work like that. It also makes them very difficult to study with NLP. Even if you read them, <coughs> So like the, like, you know, I, I, I was saying for the previous project, you could read the judicial opinions or you could read the congressional speeches. That's not even an option of these proverbs, right? Most, many of them, they're cryptic. So you have to have some external knowledge. Um, and if humans, if it's hard for humans to do, then of course NLP can't do it. But that's what we're going to use AI for. And so the data side of this project is uh, also thanks to the British Library, the British National Library, we have these really cool collections of proverbs, one from the 1600s and another from the late 1800s. We OCR'd those PDFs and extracted the proverbs uh, through some uh, regex and cl subsequent cleaning. And we also have, all from, the, um, uh, from the early English books online and then from the British Newspaper Archive, other really incredible online libraries uh, where we have 17 million pages from pre-1750 books and then we have 40 million pages from newspapers <coughs> from 1750 to 1900. And so we can actually look at how often those proverbs are used uh, from the first collection using those online search engines. And in this project, this is where the AI comes in. We don't need just the proverbs. We need an explanation that consistently lays out their social implications if we want to see how it encodes human values over time. Things. That would require thousands of hours of work by like PhD, liter English literature PhDs. It would be impossible. And as I said, standard NLP tools don't work because how are they going to know that a grasshopper is related to patients? The, even like word embeddings don't know that, right? But ChatGPT can understand these proverbs. I'm still kind of amazed by this. Uh, you are a helpful research assistant with knowledge of literary history of Proverbs. Explain the meaning of a proverb in a few sentences of plain language, including an assessment of its moral, behavioral, or ethical implications, if any. If the proverb has multiple potential meanings or implications, include all of them. Tis not for everyone to catch a salmon. Again, it has this really kind of cryptic and symbolic part, right? There's no way that a regular NLP will be able to know what this means. But ChatGPT knows that this proverb means that not everyone is capable of achieving a, achieving a difficult or prestigious task. Some people may lack the necessary skills, knowledge, or resources to accomplish certain goals, et cetera. This is about kind of human capital investment, you know, like get using your skills for the right job, right? And that's actually a really important lesson for the, in, in the Industrial Revolution. Okay, you know, should you you'd be working in the farm or on a, in a factory? This is like really, you know, or, or being a fisher, like, uh, you know, fishing for salmon. And LLMs can do this because they draw on a giant multilingual text knowledge base this data and digitization part that I talked about earlier, they can interpret metaphorical language and they can infer and interpolate meaning. And the interpolation part I think is like really important. We've been able to validate this for most of the proverbs that even those that aren't in the training data, it can infer what they mean. And that's kind of interpolating between based on its knowledge of that cultural context. 
Uh, clustering the proverbs works well. So this is bringing in BERT topic. Uh, I, can t I can tell you guys about that in the Q&A if you're curious. We get a set of proverbs that are about patience, a set of proverbs about managing conflict. These are the examples like based on the proverb examples that I showed you earlier. And these are the original proverbs, but our topics are constructed from the explanations that we produce with GPT. And in this, pro in this the, kind of the, the, the social science analysis that we want to use this is to understand how culture was changing in the Industrial Revolution. Proverbs are nice for this because they get us closer to what people thought. It's in like what, what was their kind of folk wisdom rather than what the elites or the politicians thought. So how did Proverbs usage respond to industrialization? Here are some of our three highlight results. First, there was an increase in Proverbs that encouraged hard work. This is when people were going from the farm, they kind of had to like follow the rhythms of nature, and then they had to go into the factories and like punch a clock. So Proverbs that, like an increasing emphasis on hard work and investment in human capital, it really makes sense that that was going up at the time. In the places that industrialized, this is like local newspapers in the places that got more factories. There was an increase in Proverbs that encouraged patience. And uh, this is like, you know, really consistent with the qualitative discussions at the time that around this time, people started being obsessed with time. That before the industrialization, again, people could just like, they, they got up when the sun came up, right? They didn't have clocks. But then industrial, when they had the factories, they really had to show up on time. And so people became obsessed with it. A decrease in Proverbs that idolized the past. That is also very interesting. In this time where they were really, you know, culture was shifting and uh, previously they were quite traditional and stable societies, then there was a move towards more innovation, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more kind of creative destruction, and you saw a decrease in proverbs uh, about with nostalgia um, and, and that going along with that. So, what's next? Data and Compute 1.0, so from like the 1900s and 2000s, gave us AI 1.0. This generation's AI was built with pre-AI data, compute, machine learning, and values. What will these look like in a post-AI era? Data will have a lot of, there's gonna be AI boosted digitization, like I already mentioned, we're seeing just the beginning of that, OCR, transcription, translations. AI boosted databases, like RAG optimized vector stores, optimal compression algorithms, many more, uh, you know, um, be better data linking, AI-generated data. I put a question mark there because that is something that we really have to think about whether that's a good idea or not. Compute, next generation processors optimized for AI rather than graphics. The, so GPUs were based for graphics and gaming, but the new generation could be based for AI. AI optimized cheap chipsets, I think there's a lot of work on that. On the machine learning side, you know, we have GitHub Copilot now, AI optimized programming, uh, programming languages, new architectures going beyond transformers, and values and alignment. I think we're gonna see a lot of experimentation with this in terms of integration of metadata, causal modeling, behavioral responses, bringing in some of the insights from social science into the construction of the next generation of AIs. But what else? When, what second generation AI will be brought by post AI developments in data, compute, machine learning, and values alignment? That's a very interesting question, and thank you very much.